name is Susan Kirby. I'm CEO of Screen Producers Ireland. Um, you're all very welcome this afternoon. Uh, we want to uh, welcome the director of the wonderful Ghost of Richard Harris, uh, Adrian Sibley, who I'm really delighted to be in conversation with today. Uh, by way of an introduction, Adrian has directed many documentary portraits of filmmakers. He's had the pleasure of producing work around uh, the actor Sir Anthony Hopkins, director Baz Luhrmann, the comedian Steve Martin and producer Dino Laurentiis, to mention but a few. And he's also um, taken the time to, 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 to celebrate some of our well-known musicians, including uh, Kate Bush and, and Prince. I'm enormously jealous of, of, uh, of that body of work. Um, he's also travelled with the veteran war photographer Sir Don McCullion to Syria, um, and, and I'm sure people are familiar with their work, um, The Road to Palmyra. Uh, he is an executive producer as well, and he most recently uh, produced the feature documentary Misha and the Wolves. Uh, if I can say, Adrian, you're very welcome. Um, your piece, uh, The Ghost of Richard Harris, has screened as part of the film festival. It's its its Irish premiere. It was my enormous pleasure to watch this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So uh, what we might do is uh, go straight to a short clip to introduce the piece. Sure, sure. I'm Richard Harris. I'm coming to town to sing some songs, read some poems I've written, and lie a bit. I hope you'll be there. He proposed to you and he had no money at all. The great thing about the invention. When did I invent Richard Harris? He cared passionately about his work. My friendship with my three boys is, is my life. At least if I died tomorrow, you knew that I was here. He enjoyed the tempest of life. The image of himself just sort of overtaken everything else about him. He was much, much bigger than that. Adrian, that it's a it's a short synopsis of what is an incredible piece of work. Um, can I ask you? You know, we feel, or maybe we assume, we know Harris, but. You know, this this piece of work has has made me question a lot of what I assumed about Harris. And, and certainly I feel like I know the man uh, in a more authentic way, having watched it. Can I ask you, what was the origin of this story? Well, I mean, it's interesting you say that because that it was the purpose of it in many ways, because <clears throat> I felt um, that Richard had been given somewhat short shrift in his legacy, if you can call it that, after he died. And that he, although he was perceived as a, as a rip-roaring, you know, uh, good time guy from the 60s and a, and a great actor at, at, in, in his time, he, he it had been overshadowed by this sort of image of being a hellraiser. And in fact, that's what the film really deals with, which is Jared's concern Jared Harris is his middle son, who's also a great actor. Um, mm. Check out Chernobyl or The Terror if you haven't seen them. Um, but he really was very keen, as I was, to reposition the Richard Harris and his significance as, as an actor, but also as a man, because I felt that although in many ways he was mired in the past, um, you know, with his rather outmoded approach, Errol Finn-like approach, um, and his drinking and the such, that actually there was a very interesting individual, Irishman, mm. more than mm. any, uh, behind this mask, which is a term that a lot of actors use, but in Richard's case, it was really pertinent. Um, curiously in, um, or co coincidentally perhaps, in um, Venice during the festival, there was a film called Blonde, which I don't know whether you know about it. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, 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 Dominic's the director, Australian trio with uh, Nick uh, Cave and, and Warren Ellis doing the music. But that was about Marilyn Monroe. And one of the reviewers picked up that they were both looking at the 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 um, the film and the Harris documentary. Were both looking about how these individuals created their own personas. Uh, Norma Jean created Marilyn Monroe, and Dickie Harris from Limerick and Kilkee created Richard Harris. 
Yeah, it, it's it, I I did find the the Dicky persona. Is that the persona? Is Richard the persona? Well, I think Dicky was the the origin of the story, if you will, and, and certainly Richard was the the story he created. Is that is that what you were hoping to achieve? Well, to be honest with you, you mentioned those documentaries that I did, and I did those many years ago. Actually, working on a show called Omnibus, which was fantastic. The BBC were great. Mm. Uh, back in the day, I'm not saying they aren't now, but uh, there was the opportunity to create portraits of artists. And Omnibus, um, unlike things like the South Bank show where you had a presenter, Melvin Bragg, who was sort of presenter-less. So as a, a, a younger director, I had the opportunity to mm -hmm. make films. And I was the school projectionist, you know, for, for my sins. Uh, back in the days where, I, you know, one would uh, look at little frames and 35 mil. And I uh, was quite obsessive about film. Um, and I remembered various people that we watched The Longest Day and Anthony Hopkins played this major in that with a, a huge cast. And so when it came to the opportunity, and I'd done this show called Moving Pictures about film, I was very interested in film, and I managed to make these documentaries about these figures that you mentioned, Steve Martin, Dino De Laurentiis, et cetera. And it, I was friendly with Damien Harris, the older brother, who said that his father had seen the Anthony Hopkins documentary, which really dealt with Hopkins alcoholism as much as anything which really defines his life and his his departure from Wales and and, and the West End stage to LA and Richard had a, a seemed to feel that there was something there that meant that we could potentially work together and I went to meet him at the Savoy in I think it was the millennium you know around that period um, and we had a night together uh, I should rephrase that in connection with Richard Harris. I certainly did not have a night together with Richard. <laughs> I went out with him. He took me to supper and various other people, and it was just a fantastic evening because he was everything that I'd hoped he would be. Very entertaining, completely forceful in his opinions, somewhat rude and uh, also particularly frightening and imposing mm. figure. You didn't want to get on his wrong side. Uh, but I found that all volcanic and fascinating and interesting. But unfortunately, he died. So it took us a long time to get to where we are now. Yeah, it's it's over twenty years, and and you know, so a journey that you've taken. I, I assumed in 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 watching this that the the brothers, Richard's sons, had had been motivated to actually approach you on this, but that wasn't the case. I understand. Well, we they're all film. I mean, you know, the irony of this is, although it's got nothing to do with the film, but I was actually at school with these guys because the Richard's father in Limerick, uh, when he was Dicky and grew up, um, was quite a, a significant person who lived on the Ennis Road, which is, if you know, Limerick is is mm. is particularly sort of wealthy area, and. Um, the father had been to a great public school, mm. Catholic, very Catholic. And I think Richard, when he made it, was very keen to show that he could do the same. And he sent his boys to a school called Downside, which um, is a school of Ampleforth, but it's essentially a, a sort of, you know, run by Benedictine monks, you know, yeah. and all boys. And they were there, and so was I. I was a little bit younger than them, which I they don't like but um so, so that's why i managed to uh, it, that was a sort of an affinity that meant that I, I i met damien who introduced me to his dad but i over the years got to know the others and they're all in the in the industry and jared i became came particularly close to and he was very instrumental in this because actually i was i was having a i said you know it's such a shame we never did that thing with your dad or he may have said such a shame you never did that thing with my dad and I said, well, I still think we could. And we kind of thought about it because he'd been dead for 15 years at that point. Um, and sort of slightly, as I said, lost in history. If yeah, that was yeah. Right. Um, you know, politically, the world had changed and attitude to women and drinking and controlling your, you know, well, it was pre, you know, his, he lived in the pre-Betty Ford sort of Elvis scenario of popping drugs and really indulging and Richard loved indulging. And um, so we, that's when we started again, you know, 2016, yeah. to try to see if we could make it. And it was quite a journey 
to get it off the ground, I must add. And uh, Jared was very instrumental in getting behind me because I originally was going to... Um, I always wanted him to talk about what it was like being the son of this really unusual man. And he yeah. was very important because he'd grown up under the, what can I say, the, the shadow of his father's magnificence. You know, and, and there was a line that Brancusi said about um, another, a greater sculptor or sculpture he studied under, isn't it? You know, uh, acorns don't grow under trees, you know, yeah. great trees, you know. You need, so, but Jared came round to it and yeah. we managed to get it financed. I imagine that affinity that you, you describe created great trust for the brothers in being able to uh, entrust you with this work. But, um, you clearly wanted to go beyond the image that that maybe was was understood of Harris. Do you was there anything that surprised you in what you uncovered? Yeah, um, there was a myriad of stuff. I mean, you know, for getting to his archive was really interesting because the boys had sort of, you know, with their mother had sent sent away their dad's stuff. And actually, the archive we went to in, in in if you haven't seen the movie, you'll find that there's a sequence where the boys all go to this lockup. Very very poignant. Yeah. yeah, they hadn't been. You know, they'd been a few. One of them had been a few years before. I'd never been. We shot it as it mm. happened, um, which is which has its challenges. Um, but some of it had been taken out. So, but bad, but but anyway, you know that the the revelations from that really helped me forge the film because what I didn't want to do was a traditional biography. So when I did say Stephen Mar Steve Martin or Anthony Hopkins, it kind of really went in a trajectory of their career. But because Richard has been dead, I kind of thought that, and he was such a great figure and so articulate and funny and difficult and unusual that I wanted him to tell his own story. But mm. and I wanted him to tell his own story through the prism of his sons that were still, all these years later, n not completely sure about certain aspects of their lives with him, perhaps. Mm. And those were the revelations for me that helped me forge the film. And there was even a more specific thing with that lockup, is that I took away lots of cans of film and stuff like that. And my archive producer said, oh, it's all gone to, you know, it's all film is, you know, dioxide. Yeah. yeah, it's all gone. You know, there's nothing there. And I went down to this with him to a guy called, uh, to a guy called um, Tim, who runs a thing called The Flying Spot, I think it's called, would you believe, ex-BBC guy, who has all these machines that play his old formats, you know, beta cam desks or steam bags where editors used to edit film. And we started putting this broken old film and we found the footage of the boys when they were really young that they'd never seen before. Wow. And that, I thought, oh, well, that's great. I can really just cut their youth without actually saying what happened. And then I found that tape when he goes, hello, my name's Richard Harris, and I'm going to tell you, a few, I'm going to come to your, t tell you a few lies about myself or what, you know. That was a, a reel that he'd done, and we got loads. There was about 15 takes. It started off by saying, hello, I'm Richard Harris. I'm coming to your town, and I'm going to play some songs, MacArthur Park and My Boy and Great. So, and then by the end of it, he was going, yeah, I'm Richard Harris. I'm going to tell you what a terrible time I had in. And, you know. So we had these things and we started for, forged and put them together. And then also really significantly, we had these, we got hold of these tapes that Joe Jackson, Joe Jackson, Irish uh, journalist, very good journalist. And he has done some great interviews over a period of time with lots of different people. And he made a connection with Richard and did three interviews with him. And so I knew that I really wanted to have them as a central part because what Joe managed to do was get very honest interviews yeah. um, with Richard. And, and uh, you know, they were, they were a later part of his life. So he was looking back. So it really tied into the idea of the ghost talking. So, so it's, it, there's a hybrid to the film. It, it's, it's Richard telling you his story. It's mm. his sons telling you theirs and how they reacted to him. And mm. then it also goes into some other people like Russell Crowe um, or the, the brilliant Jim Sheridan talking about working with him, and what they thought of him. If I, if I can call it a mechanism, that mechanism that you developed of creating the ghost through the different um, voices, his own voice predominantly, was enormously powerful. It feels like a good time for us maybe to jump to the clip 
of Jared that gives a real context to. Um, yeah, this is, so the, the, is that Jared? Jared goes back to the place that where his father really died. And what's really yeah. interesting is the film starts with Richard's death, and kind of ends where he was born in a way. And that was a very that was a very conscious film choice too, because again, not ma wanting to make it more filmic, a, f a feature documentary, a film. Yeah. Not just a documentary, so that you're, yeah, that's 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 it's that's. it's Jared in the Richard Harris suite. If we have that clip, I feel as though there's the image of himself that he spent a long time putting out into the world, which was you know the wild hell raising image, has sort of overtaken everything else about him. And then people, it's the first thing anybody ever says. He was much, much bigger than that. Giving voice to Richard, which I think he did very powerfully, um, and also then involving, I would have imagined you had a, an endless list of people who could have contributed to this. You curated a really interesting kind of list of contributors. Uh, can you maybe speak a little bit about that? I, I found some of the contributions so powerful, in particular, Russell Crowe's kind of, you know, connection to almost presenting Richard as a father figure. Um, yeah, for it was it was enormously powerful and and really reinforced that thread of the thematic of fatherhood that ran mm -hmm. throughout the entire thing. An enormously powerful line, which Richard himself says is his own father. Was was he a child of a family of eight or ten That's children? That's right. He was a, from a big family. And he... Big family. Know, and his father said, yeah. who is he? Which one is he? Is it, it you know, which one is he? So I, I felt like it was connecting back to this drive for Richard to establish himself and be known. Brilliant. Well, you know, that the film is about fathers and sons. I think that it, in some ways it goes beyond being just about Richard Harris and tries to touch on something slightly more. I mean, it's a terrible expression. People always use it in connection with film, but um, universal in the sense that we all have fathers and some of us have difficult rela relationships with our mm -hmm. fathers. And that is something that was there. And he was like a father figure to Russell Crowe. Um, and even for Jim Sheridan, but Jim Sheridan battled with him because of that. And of course, then his sons were so much dealing with, still, still deal with their relationship with him now, which, which, which really moves them. Um, I've forgotten what your question was, though. Actually, in, in, in because I'm very... how did you curate the list of contributors? Oh. Uh, so, <laughs> well, there has been a documentary or two about Richard before, but uh, without wanting to question what those documentaries in any way, I really felt they just kind of went through, oh, you know, so-and-so can talk about him. You know, let's get Clint Eastwood to talk about Unforgiven and let's get Robert Duvall to talk about um, um, being Ernest Hemingway. And, you know, why don't we get uh, um, Harry Potter? Uh, no, he's not called Harry Potter, is he? He's called um, Danny Radcliffe. Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah. yeah. I think he's, you know, like, anyway. So let's get all of them. And I did sort of begin to trot down that path as one does. But then I kind of pulled back because I thought, no, that's the easy option. I don't think these people know him really well. And I don't think they know the complexity of him. And I think Richard would be playing, you know, a certain role with these guys. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Daniel's too. So I actually wanted to talk to people that I felt... <clears throat> had been moved by him and had mm. connected with him in the same way that we go to places where his spirit haunts, like mm. the Savoy or the Troubadour where the parents, where he married uh, the, the mother of the Harris boys, Elizabeth, who passed away while we were making the film. So the film is dedicated to her, actually. She was so instrumental in his life. And Richard was so great in that he he remained, his relationships may not have worked, but he remained very close with the people that he mm. was close to, and his two wives in particular, and Elizabeth. Um, so I really chose, tried to get to the people that I thought were going to tell us something from the heart, and also that we may not know. And you know, I just bounced through them in my head. You know, Manny DeLuca was one of the first people we went to because he was about 10 years younger than Richard or the such, but but was had been deeply affected by their relationship in Kilkey. And I felt that Kilkey was so significant to the Irishness of Richard. Mm -hmm. 
which never left him, although he left Ireland like so many great Irish men and women. But he was his heart was always there. In fact, he called his house in the Bahamas Kilkey House. So you can kind of that kind of says it. Um, but then you get Leela Doolan, who's this amazing producer who was so sort of frank and honest about what she felt about who Richard was. And she was there right at the beginning. And yeah. I thought she was great. I, unfortunately, I, she was interviewed after Jim Sheridan in the same location. And Jim and I kept taught for much longer we did. And Lena was kept like, I've got to get my train back to... She was a fantastic character. A wonderful yeah, female voice in there as well. Oh, I wanted female voices because actually, you know, Richard, you know, these these men can get lost in their sort of beer swilling enthusiasm <laughs> for Guinness and, and talking about the opposite sex. Uh, and Richard was at the forefront of that. But actually what was really endearing about him, well, endearing maybe anything, to say Richard was endearing is probably not the right word, but what I liked about Richard is that he had a great respect for women mm. and didn't seem to judge them in a, in a, in a, in a way... You know, he, he did feel a difference to them and he did think that there was a war of the sexes, which I didn't get into. But at the same time, you know, like, for example, he never publicly talked about his affair with Princess Margaret. Yeah. You know, and he could have done and he didn't. I found found that honourable, and I felt that you know, with, you know, you saw him with Leela and and and, and, Dula, and when she interviews him when he's become successful and he's a lead actor on the at the royal court the most sort of powerful place for british theatrical drama you know mm -hmm. and richard's the lead in it and it's literally it's only 10 years after he's been trying to pretend to be marlon brando that you know in kill key you know, yep. it's just yeah. staggering how, what he did and what he achieved. So I really wanted people like that. And Russell Russell was a bit of a Moby Dick situation. You know, I had to reel him in. It was like, you know, he's 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 a large character himself and uh, in demand still. And, yeah. you know, kind of didn't, didn't really, you know, why would he want to talk about Richard Harris and what he really personally felt about him? So he was the last interview and a great interview. It really was. Stephen Ray... Just brilliant. I mean, I love them all. And, you know, Stephen Ray is just such a fascinating man himself. You know, I kind of nearly had to say story, sorry to these guys that we were talking about Harris because they, I'd have loved to talk about them, but they were very generous. Phil Coulter was so accurate. Phil you Coulter know, was, I was quite surprised to see Phil, Phil Coulter there, but obviously it opened up a whole other dynamic and, and conversation. And I, I thought he was enormously honest as well, mm -hmm. you know, kind of saying his poetry did nothing for him, but he had enormous respect for him in all other ways. I thought Phil Coulter really surprised me because I kind of thought, I didn't expect that he would be, you know, he's very comfortable with who he is, which is something that somebody said about Richard. I cut it out, the, the guy, the photographer from the Lost Weekend sequence, which we may look at later, mm. said, I've never, ever met somebody that knew who he was yeah. and was so confident with what he said. What... I, the reason why I didn't use it was it was true, but then, like all of us, it changes. And I said this to somebody else. I, you know, Elvis Presley was even couldn't believe he was Elvis Presley by the time he was later in life. Joe Strummer, the lead singer of the Clash, mm -hmm. you know, which had been the most forceful band, you know, just sort of uh, the band of its period, you know, politically. And, and Strummer was this sort of amazing, forceful figure. But, you know, when he came back, he couldn't quite... He, he was nervous. He was not sure about whether he could do it again or, in fact... And, so, you know, I remember somebody had to say, you know, Joe, you're Joe Strummer. <laughs> you know, he had to re be reminded. And actually, the reason why I didn't use that thing about Richard is because Richard at times lost the way... Phil Coulter says a line. He says he still had it together when he was working with him. Yeah. Because there was a period where he did it. But, but Richard was like a great boxer. He always used to come back and he, he got back into the ring with the field and just was tremendous. Uh, it strikes me as you're speaking that Richard Harris was somebody who really drew on his life experiences, the, the enormous challenges that he had, um, and brought those complex issues into his performances. And you mentioned Stephen Ray. He he uh, 
speaks very candidly about the, the acting opposite Harris and the fear he had uh, when he was presented with that raw anger. We might have a quick look. I think we have another clip. I'm not sure what it's called, but uh, Stephen Ray, if, if that clip is available. 